Hello, everyone. Welcome to SNEA's Ethernet Storage Forum webinar series. Uh, today's topic is our second part for architectural principles for network solid state storage access. It's uh, quite a mouthful, to be sure. And back with us today is Doug Voigt, the chair of the NVM programming model on the SNEA Technical Council, and also a distinguished technolo uh, technologist for HPE. Uh, my name is Jay Metz. I'm going to be your host and MC for today's extravaganza. I'm an R&D engineer for Advanced Storage for Cisco and on SNEA's Board of Directors, and we're both extremely pleased and excited to be talking about this with you today, especially given the success of the, uh, the first one. Well, if you're new to SNEA, uh, we are an industry association that represents 160 unique member companies. And we have over 3,500 active contributing members that reach a community of over 50,000 IT end users and storage professionals worldwide. So before we get started on today's webinar, I know you're all itching to find out more information about uh, non-volatile memory and load store and, and I.O. Uh, let's just get through a little bit of administrative administrative and get it out of the way. Um, first, if you're finding yourself having problems with the audio cutting out, for example, if you happen to be uh, listening to audio through your computer browser, we found that this is often an issue with various browser caches. Uh, emptying the cache and reloading the browser often helps. Second, the information that's contained in this presentation is copyrighted by SNEA, and any member company and individual members may use this material in presentations and literature uh, as long as the slides are not modified and SNEA is acknowledged as the source. Of course, even though we do the best we can to be as accurate as possible, you are encouraged to use this wisdom and scintillating brilliance at your own risk. One final bit of information. Uh, please feel free to use the question button at the top of the screen, or bottom of the screen, or or maybe on your browser, to ask anything you like during the course of the presentation. We'll do our best to answer them in the time allotted. Um, but also, don't forget to rate the presentation at the conclusion of the seminar. Um, constructive comments are also really appreciated. If you've got concepts or topics that you'd like to see in the future, that's the best place to put them. And then last uh, but not least, and we'll look over this again for those who joined late, uh, the presentation will be available along with a blog that addresses all the questions at a URL on the Ethernet Storage Forum's website, and we'll put that at the end. So enough of me. We're going to pass this over to Doug right now. So, Doug, you're on. Okay. Thanks, Jay. Um so this is, as Jay pointed out, part two uh, of, a, of a sequence. I'm going to do a little bit of review, um, but not very much, and, and then head very, very directly into the main content. Uh, so I think people are aware that uh, there's a new set of technologies, which I refer to as persistent memory technologies, that have emerged. They're faster than flash. Uh, and they're being used in a variety of ways, uh, and it's still a very uh, emergent and evolving technology category. Um, and it affects the way applications view, uh, you know, view memory and storage. Um, this is creating a lot of dynamics, both in terms of the technology emergence itself, application response, uh, and the, you know, the various types of marketing and positioning that takes place when such an inflection point emerges. So. What we're really trying to do is to is to uh, reapply some foundational principles that, in spite of the changing technology, you know, there have not really changed. Um, you know, and, and those are in the areas of application view uh, of both memory and storage. The two are sort of converging in a sense. Um, you know, and latency, data access time, and the importance of that, uh, you know, in this inflection point. And that's what we're really going to harp on today is, is, is latency and how it creates disruption, uh, you know, and, and how to reason about that in the context of both local and networked uh, access to persistent memory. So I'm going to dwell primarily on principles. Uh, you know, there's, there's a bit of a disclaimer here. Uh, the idea is to allow, uh, you know, foundational principles to guide detailed analysis. I want to enable people to do that, suggest some lines of thinking, um, but I'm not reporting on benchmark results, you know, so 
uh, although there are some numbers, uh, obviously, in this presentation, they're, they're typical. They're sort of example numbers that are in the right, part, you know, hopefully in the right ballpark, uh, but they're, they're not benchmark uh, measurements. Um, and here's a pointer to the prior webcast uh, leading up to this one. So first, uh, you know, I think I've actually already covered quite a bit of, of what I've listed on this slide. Um, so I am going to continue to uh, the principles that we're going to cover. Uh, we're going to talk quite a bit about uh, how applications can view persistent memory technology, uh, and there are a couple of different ways that, that you know that, that view can can occur. Um, and then why is latency important, and how do we analyze latency for different types of systems? Um, and then a little bit about how system scale can affect latency as well. Um, and you'll see why that matters in, in some new ways, uh, you know, with, with, with persistent memory. I want to do some definitions uh, first, and we will go into more detail on all of these, but just kind of up front. Uh, when I talk about I.O., I'm talking about basically the protocol used to access storage, uh, like disk I.O. Or, or, you know, things like all the SCSI family of protocols, MVME, you know, those are all, you know, I.O. style protocols. Um, the word polling I use, I think people pretty much, uh, you know, kind of understand that is just the repeated checking or reading of, of a piece of state information in order to watch for an event for completion, let's say, of an I.O. Uh, context switch uh, is the alternative to polling where you allow other processes to run, like perhaps you've got some code that's, that started a disk I.O. You know, uh, if it's going to take a while, you'd normally context switch out of that the process that's waiting for the I.O., right, just so, so people, you know, have a common understanding of that reference. Um, load store is a little bit less common, uh, you know, understanding because it goes right into the CPU instruction set. Um, you know, so if you're mainly accustomed to dealing with programming languages and, and higher level code, you know, th this is at the bottom, at the bottom of the stack. Uh, so load store are actual CPU instructions uh, specific to, a, you know, an instruction set architecture over CPU. They're the instructions that have operands that access memory. I use this as a proxy for any kind of uh, instruction that, that actually accesses memory from a CPU instruction execution point of view. And then finally, another fair, you know, fairly low-level hardware concept, which is NUMA, the non-uniform memory access. Uh, that describes a family of memory systems, uh, you know, that exist already in supercomputing, uh, and that tend to exhibit a significant range of latencies, either because they have different technologies, memory technologies, or because they have scale, uh, you know, differences. Memory is some memory is further away from you than other memory, and that creates this non-uniform memory access environment. So there are some foundational definitions that should help uh, as we move into the main content. Now let's drill a little more into I.O. versus load store. This is what was uh, covered in part one. This is the main recap. Um, when you're doing I.O., uh, the application that wants to do the I.O., wants to communicate with a disk or an SSD, it will um, put the data in RAM buffers, either on its way out or, on, or as it comes back in. It, you know, CPU memory buffers is where the data resides, and the software, uh, you know, executes, uh, you know, sends a command out, right, to to the SSD or disk through drivers, right, um, you know, and then it has control. The software has control over how it waits for that to come back. It can use either context switch or polling, uh, you know, as examples to wait for the completion. Um, you know, and status comes back too, right? You'll get a completion code back from the device that says whether it worked or not. Um, when you're using load or store instructions, and, and there can be other instructions such as a move instruction that, that are, are basically, I put them in the same category, um, data is moving between processor registers uh, and, uh, you know, usually RAM or persistent memory, but, you know, some, some type of memory. Uh, so the load would be, you know, loading data from memory into a processor register or storing data from a processor register out to memory. Um, you know, so, you know, that, that's quite different from doing an I.O. Um, 
because the software doesn't really have a choice. Once the software triggers that, that instruction execution in the processor, the processor will force the software to wait until the instruction is done. Um, you know, now there's a whole lot of, of intelligence in the processor regarding, uh, you know, things it can do in the meantime, and I'll talk a little bit about that, so about pipelining. But the bottom line is the software at that point is not in control of how to wait, right? It will, it will just sit there, uh, you know, and the core will just, just wait until that memory access is completed. So that's quite different from, you know, from what happens in I.O. The other thing that's quite different is, um, that there's no actual status coming back from the memory operation that gets up to the application level. All that happens is if there's an error, you'll get an exception. Uh, and that, too, is quite different from, from I.O., where you get an explicit status back and you can check it before moving forward. All right, so just to make sure people really understand that distinction that I'm making between I.O. and load store, and this is, this is the application's point of view. Um, now, it's very important uh, to distinguish the application's point of view from the technology itself. And that's the kind of where, where the starting place for this slide is to say, okay, I, 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 when, I, when I have a flash or hard disk technology, an SSD, maybe using a SCSI uh, protocol or, or uh, NVMe type protocol or, or, or SATA, for example, um, you know, I'm using a disk driver to access that technology and the application is seeing IO. On the other hand, um, if I have persistent memory, it really it's accessed using memory instructions, right? So here I've illustrated the application is, is, is spitting out load store instructions through the processor, right? Um, you know, and those are directly accessing the persistent memory, uh, you know, using memory cycles, perhaps in cache line size units. And now an interesting thing uh, to layer onto this is that, that uh, you know, you can actually uh, cross over between these two, uh, you know, views. Um, it's, it's certainly possible for an application to, to, to see I.O. when it's actually talking to persistent memory. Um, and all you need to do that is a disk driver, right, a RAM disk driver. And these are very common. And in fact, there are some new ones that account for some of the properties of persistent memory. You know, so if you if you have persistent memory, uh, but your application does not uh, use load store instructions to access it directly, does not memory map it, is another term for that, um, you can still access it using I.O. through a RAM disk driver. Um, similarly, although a little bit more complicated, you can use load store instructions to access data that that is permanently residing on the disk. And the way that's done, is by temporarily bringing that data up into RAM, perhaps into let's say the Linux page cache, and then while it's in the page cache, you could you could memory map it, give it application accessible memory addresses, and manipulate it. And then at the end, there's a, there's a sync or flush instruction when when you want that data to be flushed from RAM back out to to your hard disk, and it's not persistent until you do that. So. It's a very interesting, uh, you know, sort of dual stack scenario where you can have either a hard disk or a persistent memory technology accessed using either an application view that's I.O. or load store, and you can do either view with either technology. Obviously, your performance will vary a lot depending on, on which of these paths you choose. But logically, it's interchangeable. So this is the most important slide. Uh, and, and, you know, some of you, many of you may have seen this slide before if you've seen almost any of presentation about persistent memory from me, because uh, from my view, this kind of tells the story of this, the disruption that's caused by latency. Um, on this graph, I've got, you know, four different technology examples, you know, hard disks, SSDs in the middle, and then persistent memory over on the right. Uh, the y-axis is a conceptually a, a, a time scale, a latency, how long does a, an access take? Uh, and I view this as a log scale, um, and, and I've got a couple of, of points labeled, so important transition points. Um, one of them is at 200 nanoseconds, right? This, uh, this number is, is uh, approximately the acceptable latency for a NUMA memory system. Uh, historically, uh, these systems have been built in supercomputers, um, and while it's not like some kind of hard and fast rule, 
Um, you know, if you can do memory access in 200 nanoseconds in a, in a large scale memory system that has generally been viewed as acceptable, um, you know, but still a sort of non-uniform memory access system. Uh, the fastest memory accesses are, are, you know, in tens of, of nanoseconds, you know, an order of magnitude faster than this, this kind of NUMA threshold. Uh, but, but the 200 nanosecond threshold has historically been acceptable, uh, you know, to, to use it, use the, the technology as memory. Um, the other threshold here is uh, two microseconds. And, and this is the threshold where, you know, typically, uh, you know, if you're doing an IO, um, that takes uh, only two microseconds or less, you will probably want to pull for completion of the I.O. because by the time you context switch, uh, and this is specific to the processor architecture, it's very likely that the I.O. will be done uh, before you can even context switch back. Like if all you did was context switch out and back, uh, you know, the I.O. might be finished, you know, by, by the time you got back. Um, so that's a scenario where you might prefer to pull. And in between is kind of this 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 no man's land, which we're going to explore a little bit. That that sort of crosshatched area, where you know if you're not under 200 nanoseconds or thereabouts, uh, you know, and you're not over two microseconds, you know, then you might want to use load store instructions, or you might want to use I/O with polling. Um, and it's it's actually a difficult trade-off, and that's really what we're going to explore in detail. Uh, in the remainder of this presentation. Um, so I'm going to use a purist definition of persistent memory. It's something that, that is persistent, um, and you can use feasibly use load store or move instructions to access it without losing too much of your processor throughput. Um, and this is a key question, you know, at the bottom here: is when is it okay, uh, you know, to to place a technology, a persistent memory technology in the memory system, you know, access it as memory, uh, at what latency is it is it just too much, right? And when, the pain perhaps of, of stalling your processor, and I'll go into what that means here in a minute, you know, is is perhaps unacceptable. Uh, and somewhere between that 200 nanosecond and that two microsecond thresholds, you know, it, it becomes too painful uh, in general to access the technology as memory using load store, and you'll want to switch over to I.O., uh, you know, if your latency is, is towards the upper end of that range. Why? Um, so here I have illustrated, uh, you know, something taking place inside the processor. The processor's pipelining instruction execution, right? And, and each instruction goes through several phases of execution stages. Uh, here I've, I've shown five stages, each with a column inside the processor. Uh, the, the letters stand for you know, fetch, decode, execute, then there may be a memory cycle, and then there may be a write cycle going back to some registers. Uh, you know, so this is just a, a sort of symbolic pipeline. Uh, most processors are more sophisticated than this, but I think this, this serves to illustrate uh, how instructions throw, flow through the pipeline. So what you see uh, vertically is different time points, right? And you can see the numbers inside the boxes represent instructions flowing through different stages of the pipeline over time. Everything goes nice and smoothly until you get to time six, at which point I suppose, right, I, I inject the notion that uh, instruction three actually does a memory access. And perhaps that takes longer than a typical pipeline stage uh, cycle. Therefore, the, the whole pipeline for that core uh, stalls, and that's what's shown here in red for several time cycles, uh, you know, hypothetically until the memory access is done, at which point the pipeline can resume. So it not only delayed the instruction that experienced the, you know, the, the memory access, but also everything behind it. Um, you know, so that's kind of an illustration of what it means to stall the processor's pipeline, uh, and that is aggravated when you put it in the context of a larger system where you've got many cores, um, you know, all with, you know, with their own pipelines, um, accessing memory through memory controller. And there are one or more queues in the memory controller. And the key here is that the requests from all the cores tend to intermingle in those queues coming through the memory controller, depending, of course, on the design of the memory controller. And they're, the, 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 they're intermingled not only uh, with across the cores, but also across the memory technologies, right? There may be some persistent memory accesses and some DRAM accesses all intermingled in the memory controller. 
on the way to this kind of hybrid memory system that I've illustrated on the right. So that makes it worse, basically. There are also pipelines inside the, the you know, the, the, the NVDIMs here, the, you know, either the DIMs or the NVDIMs, right? So hopefully you can get kind of a mental picture of how this sort of thing can cascade and, and, and po possibly have kind of a domino effect to where long memory accesses to persistent memory can end up storing, you know, stalling multiple cores because they conflict coming through the memory controller or, or at least have to wait you know, for their queue slots, and, you know, to come up as they move through the memory controller. Um, now, this is a, a well-known context in supercomputers, and, uh, you know, NUMA systems are designed to, to tolerate these effects, uh, to, you know, and get acceptable overall CPU performance within certain bounds of memory latencies, and that's where that 200 nanosecond number comes up, right, as they're designed to accommodate, uh, you know, these phenomena and, and get good system performance in spite of them, you know, up to a point, you know, and where is that point? You know, now that really depends on the processor architecture and the mix of instructions in the application. All right, so uh, this is why it's very hard to put a single number on it. So I give a range, uh, you know, that I think is 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 defensible, but somewhere in that range, the pain. Uh, of trying to do load store to your persistent memory, you know, it's likely to become overwhelming, uh, you know, so that when you get to that top of the range, the 200 mic, the, I mean, sorry, the two microsecond level, you'll probably want to be doing I.O. Um, so if you're doing load store, the advantage is that that's the, the lowest overhead way, you know, possible to get at your persistent data. Right. However, it may stall, uh, you know, one or more pipelines inside your memory and processor. Right, which wastes valuable processor time, right, and the acceptable latency is the, is determined by this kind of NUMA guideline. Um, if you're polling, the advantage is that that although it's somewhat more overhead than just an, a single instruction, right, it's not as much overhead as a context switch. Uh, however, it, it consumes one thread, um, and I'm 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 being a little cavalier here about a distinction between a thread and a process, or I, I mean a thread and a core. Um, that's processor architecture specific, um, you know, so I'm, I'm not going into detail on how particular processors stall either threads or cores. Uh, the concept is, uh, you know, is essentially the same, and that's where that two microsecond, uh, you know, guideline comes into play. And then finally, if you do a full out context switch, that has quite a bit of overhead, relatively speaking, you know, but the advantage is it doesn't really waste any more processor time than that overhead of getting in and out of, you know, of doing the context switch, right? So you're not wasting it outside of the, you know, the, well, not wasting the processor outside of the context switch overhead. Um, I already mentioned, uh, you know, the NUMA latency uh, guideline, right, depends on a number of factors. Uh, the, the polling guideline does as well, they, you know, depend on a lot of processor-specific characteristics, such as how long is a context switch on a given processor. So coming back to this picture, hopefully uh, you now have a deeper understanding of why this picture is so important. Uh, it's really sort of the one slide, uh, you know, that says, you know, how should I think through this question of, you know, if I've got a persistent memory technology, how do I want to access it? Uh, and that depends on the latency you're going to experience during the access. And that's what this slide is all about. So on that slide um, with the with the graph, um, mm -hmm. and we're we're actually um, focusing mostly on that cross hash pattern. Uh, this particular presentation, but the question did come in about mm -hmm. the upper level scale of, of what we're talking about because the, the chart seems to um, to go off into an entity. Uh, in your head, what's what's the you know that upper boundary latency that we're actually looking at? You know, what what uh, kind of uh, yeah, okay. time can I think about? You know, like the where's the top of this chart, right? Uh, well, that would be you know typical times for accessing hard disks. All right, is is kind of defines the upper top, you know, the upper layer of this, the top part of this chart. Um, you know, and and you know, usually hard disk accesses, if they have to do any kind of actual media access, you know, end up taking a good millisecond, and many times, you know, somewhere between one and ten milliseconds. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's why this is a log scale, right? Is once you get up about halfway up that orange area, you're into milliseconds and tens of milliseconds. 
Um, you know, thresholds of pain on disk accesses start probably, you know, around 50 milliseconds, which sounds like a lot, but, you know, if you're dealing with a lot of dynamics in your system, you know, some, you know a few of your IOs may have much higher, uh, you know, latent, latencies on a disk drive. Um, you know, so it usually starts to get a bit painful when you get into tens of, of uh, milliseconds. And if it gets anywhere near a second, you're probably in trouble, right? Something's probably going wrong. Uh, you may still want to be trying to recover your data with heroics that take longer than that, but, but once you get up in the range of a second, you're pretty much at the top of this chart. Uh, you know, so hopefully that kind of fills things in a little bit. Yeah, it's, 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 it's orange turns into red pretty, uh, pretty soon. Yeah. Which is strictly good. <laughs> Um, and it depends and, and, on the technology, right? In SSDs, you won't want to let it get anywhere near that, right? But I think people understand right. that distinction. Right. Uh, but it's always good to, to be clear about it, too. Uh, we also got a question that came in with regards to your stalled pipeline, um, and, and I think it's actually a good one to address now, uh, even we may be touching on it a little bit later as well. So um, with regards to, you know, um, handling long sequential reads and writes, um, how do you how do you handle those those uh, when you want to avoid stalling um, pipelines? Uh, use DMA, <laughs> right? Okay. Is the, you know, kind of the very short answer. You know, so you've got two choices, right? For doing, you know, if you're using, you know, if you're using processor instructions, you can use a move instruction. Right, and if you've got a very high-speed memory, uh, you know, interconnect, uh, high bandwidth, you know, and I, you know, by which I mean like potentially tens of gigabytes, you know, if you've got a really high-end memory system, you may be able to use, you know, move significant blocks of data within that, you know, 200 nanosecond window, depending on all the variables in your system. All right, so if you're in that realm, you may be able to feel safe to use a move instruction from one memory location to another. You know, which does block the pipeline, right? But all those parameters determine whether that's a painful thing to do or not. If it's too painful, you can always turn that into an I.O. by doing DMA, right, where you, you describe the buffer, the two memory regions that you want move one to the other. You launch a command, a DMA, you know, command to a DMA engine inside your system that, uh, you know, that copies the data, and then you wait for that to finish using either polling or, or you know, block on it with a context switch and ultimately an interrupt. So DMA is the answer to the question. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and to that end, I, we actually have somebody who asked a question that segues really nicely into the next section. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read the question, but the next section actually addresses the entirety of this. Um, so the question is, where would network-based network data access uh, fall in terms of SAN or NAS, fall in terms of latency, where the backing SAN has the data in memory cache? In other words, what is the time cost latency of making a network call to get the data, even if it's in resident memory on the remote end of, for REMA? Yeah. So it, yeah. we're all now we're talking about latency budgets, and um, and and I, that's just, that's a question that I think you know it sets us up perfectly for the next part of it. Yes, yes, exactly. That is why we are here. That very question. <laughs> Um, so, any other questions? This is a good point uh, this is for for taking any other questions before we dive. No, nope, go for it. Into uh, latency. Dive headlong. <laughs> yep. All good. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to build up our conceptual latency budgets with with some numbers, right? Uh, you know, the idea is. Uh, to give to give people some uh, some practice reasoning about this and uh, you know some guidelines on things to to consider when you're going to do a detailed analysis of your own system as an engineer this is not something that a user would typically do but as an engineer of a system you might do some latency budget calculations for your system you know so I want to give some examples of that I want to build it up using some building blocks. Uh, you know, interconnect hops. Interconnects here are, are, let's say, networks, although I give an interconnect example that is arguably not exactly a network, uh, you know, a little later. Uh, so there, there's one of the building blocks is your network in terms of latency contribution. The second is the media itself. You know, are you talking to persistent memory, an SSD, or a disk drive? Um, and then on the other end, there's the host, the drivers. Uh, you know, are there drivers involved, or are you you're just executing instructions, right? So, 
you know, on the host side, uh, you know, there's there's some latency building blocks there for your budget. Um, and then the question of queuing, uh, where uh, the throughput versus response time characteristic starts to enter into the system if you bias towards throughput, uh, you know, your response time goes up. So I want to, you know, to make sure people are at least familiar with that effect, uh, you know, in, this, in these systems. Um, here's the the um, the building blocks for uh, interconnect, right? And I'm talking really here about the today's uh, you know, pervasive serial interconnects, right? Not not so much a parallel, but more of a serial type interconnect. Uh, you know, and how do you reason about the latencies there? Uh, what are the considerations? Well, you know, when you start talking about nanoseconds, start counting nanoseconds, the speed of light starts to matter, even on a rack scale. Uh, you know, so I give a couple of examples here. You know, uh, well, one example. Uh, you know, if I if I need to travel a couple meters, perhaps using an optical cable inside a rack, you know, uh, that you know speed of light, you know, gives you about seven nanoseconds for that, well, which is small. But if you're adding up, you know, and trying to hit, you know, 100 nanoseconds or 200 or something like that for your interconnect, you know, these things start to add up, right? Um, you know, also there is a, you know, a hardware component called the CERTES. That stands for serializer deserializer. Um, and that's the point where you go from, uh, sort of regular electronics, you know, using copper traces on, uh, PC printed circuit boards and stuff like that. You know, uh, you transition from that into, let's say, an optical or a serial pair transmission line. You know, whether it's optical or copper. Copper ones are slower. Uh, because of all kinds of effects, right, uh, electromagnetic effects uh, that are in play in the copper transmission line. Um, but to get in and out of that serial line, you have to go through a piece of CERTES hardware. And those, depending on their design and the technology of their implementation, you know, can take either, ten, you know, tens of or even up to a 100 or so nanoseconds, uh, you know, in terms of what they consume. So obviously, if you're trying to stay within a, a NUMA memory access budget, you're going to want a very efficient CERTES running not in an FPGA, right, running in a full-out ASIC so that it can run at a high clock rate. Uh, you know, so that can be a consideration. Uh, I think people are mostly familiar with the data transfer itself. Uh, there's some sort of transition bit rate associated with your interconnect. Obviously, you have to count both whatever headers are involved and whatever payloads involved. And then there's generally an encoding as you enter and leave the, the serial line. And there's some efficiency of that encoding. Uh, the most common is uh, eight bits of data for every 10 bits of, uh, you know, of uh, transmission line, you know, consumed. This is based on the way in which the data is encoded as it goes over the serial line. So there's there's a, an encoding derating to be accounted for when you know when you calculate your data transfer time. Um, you know, and then there's the port. There's some there's some delay that can take place in the port at either end of the interconnect. After you're through the 30s, right? There's some hardware that that you know deals with the port itself. Uh, and you know, in some cases, that can be extremely efficient if you're in a very localized and highly optimized environment. So I, I, I allowed that to be essentially just the 30s. Uh, but in other cases, uh, you know, that hardware takes some time. It may have some queue management involved. Uh, you know, various steps of processing. Uh, you know, so it may take, uh, let's say, up to 100 nanoseconds or so just to do the port hardware at the ends. Uh, then well, for switching and routing, it is hard to constrain that because of, of a very wide range of, of you know, protocols, uh, you know, switch optimizations, and scale, right? More and more switches in the system, you know, add up. So I, I did not put a restrictive number on that. Um, so then what I, what I suggest is that, that while these are the considerations, it's probably best to sort of stand back and look at these as, as you know, as whole examples, right, typical examples. If you're dealing with PCIe, um, you know, you may be able to get as low as 20 nanoseconds, uh, you know, in terms of the, a transit time, a hop time through a PCIe interconnect. So that's very fast, uh, you know, and, and memory systems tend to operate on, on similar speeds to that uh, in terms of, of, you know, switch latencies, interconnect latencies. Um, if you're using something like InfiniBand, uh, it, you know, it's pretty efficient too, but it's more, you know, perhaps up in the 90 nanosecond. This is a very dynamic area, right? People are re-optimizing, 
all the time, you know, in interfaces like InfiniBand, uh, you know, but the best I've seen up to this point, uh, you know, is probably about 90 seconds, 90 nanoseconds for a switch hop in InfiniBand. In Ethernet, uh, there's more routing involved. There's a lot more uh, sort of network infrastructure along the way. Uh, so th there you tend to get into several hundred nanoseconds, uh, you know, to transition through to do an interconnect hop over Ethernet uh, network. Um, so just to kind of give you an appreciation of, of what kinds of contributions, right, and then a little equation here to say when you're trying to assess the latency of an interconnect hop, you know, here are the things that you probably should, should add up. Uh, you know, a couple of ports, you know, maybe, uh, you know, the hardware in the ports gives you, you know, tens of nanoseconds, uh, the switches. Um, which, which uh, depending on your technology, is at least 20 nanoseconds and, and most likely quite a bit more. And then the distance, uh, you know, which, which is just speed of light. Uh, you know, and, and I'll, I'll suggest some of what, what arises from that uh, in a couple minutes. So that's how I would think about the network part. Um, now we've got the media part, right? And, and Depending on how you're accessing your media, you know, you may have um, multiple hops through your network, right? You may have to send a command, exchange the data, receive the response, right? This is very familiar to, you know, people are familiar with disks or SSDs, uh, you know, and, and just the hardware contribution, depending on the optimization of that system, uh, you know, can be anywhere, you know, over a couple of orders of magnitude, right? Somewhere anywhere between as low as 10 nanoseconds up to maybe a microsecond. Um, and then, uh, you have to account for, for driver software in the, on the media side and perhaps, uh, interrupt response. Uh, and that usually takes microseconds. Now, I put zero there because if you're doing load store access, there, you know, you don't really have any of that, right? But, if typically you have a driver, and I put a proxy of about 20 microseconds uh, on, you know, on the driver. You know, that varies a lot depending on a whole bunch of, of you know, processor and software, uh, you know, optimization variables. Um, then inside the media, you may have a, translation, a flash translation layer, for example, or a disk array implementation or something like that. And so that I've labeled here as translation or virtualization of the storage. Um, and typically, you know, if that stack takes more than 100 microseconds or so, you know, it's probably not very well optimized, right? So it should be less than that. And in some cases, there is no such, uh, you know, stack, right? So that's why I put that range there. Um, and then there's there's always some kind of seek or seek equivalent, whether it's a, you know, chip select or, or something like that. And that creates a really wide range. Uh, you know, from tens of, you know, 10 nanoseconds up to a millisecond. Uh, depending on the technology, right? So there I've listed a few. Obviously, you have to count for the, trans, you know, the uh, media rate. So here are the examples. If it's DRAM, you know, uh, in today's uh, DDR systems, you know, you can get that into the 20 nanosecond range if you're if you're really optimal. Um, if it's flash, you're probably running around the 70 microsecond range. This depends on a lot of variables again. Um, you know, if you're in a hard disk, uh, you're probably more in the millisecond range. Uh, you know, so here are some sort of proxies, or at least in the ballpark of things you might expect for the different te media technologies. Um, a couple more things to account for. There's a host driver in many cases, um, and it's pretty hard to get the host driver side done in less than a microsecond if you're doing any kind of I.O. Uh, you know, and, you know, if, and as with the media, if your driver stack, you know, is not you know, can't complete in, let's say, about 50 microseconds, then there's probably some optimization that, you know, that could be done. So typically, a, you know, a small number of tens of microseconds or even single-digit microseconds with some things like NVMe, uh, you know, might be a reasonable expectation for the driver in the host. Um, so I want to talk a minute about queuing considerations, right? Here I introduce a, you know, fundamental uh, tenet of, of queuing theory. Uh, which is called Little's Law. Um, this picture where I have arrivals, right, coming into a queue and they experience perhaps some wait time in the queue leading to a service center. This is queuing theory language, um, but it's very, very common, right? People who have done benchmarking say, okay, uh, you know, um, 
I have a test, I have a benchmark, it's generating IOs, those are my arrivals, uh, you know, and my Q depths, uh, you know, or, or my, uh, they call it different names, right? It's really a multiprocessing level. It's how many threads do I have generating IOs at the same time in my benchmark, right? That determines the intensity of my arrivals, right? And I think, you, you know, that's, so it's just a way of describing, you know, how fast is, is work arriving. Right, and then there's a queue, and then the service center says how fast can work be accomplished. Right, and here's the thing: is if I'm in a steady state, and my arrivals are greater than my service times, right, then I, my system's going to explode. Right, I will never keep up. Right, so that is what creates the asymptote that you always see when you think about uh, throughput versus uh, response time or latency. The throughput is represented here by an arrival rate. Right, or you might see it in IOPS, or you might see it in megabytes per second, depending on how your workload is best described. Right, and the latency is how long do I have to wait? Right, and if I'm just looking at the queuing effects alone, right, Little's Law says there's an asymptote. The maximum service rate, the maximum IOs per second that I could possibly do, right, um, you know, if I've got any kind of probability distribution of my arrivals, you know, I'm, I'm probably not going to be actually able to sustain that maximum. That maximum is the asymptote uh, of this response time throughput picture. All right, so many of us see this type of picture over and over again. It's actually a good way to reason about, you know, uh, you know, queuing delay in systems. You know, and it and it matters, right? It can be a, a significant factor. You know, so if you're biasing towards throughput, you're probably going to see higher latency. And you want to choose a, a point along the knee of that curve, right, where you where you want your system to function, you know, giving you acceptable throughput versus latency, uh, you know, uh, uh, characteristic. So let's put it together. Put it together in several ways. I have three examples, uh, you know, a pure I/O example, an RDMA example, and what I call a scale-out memory example. Um, I'm not going to go back through the disclaimers here. These are approximate numbers. Uh, you know, I, uh, you know, some some do better, some do worse. Uh, you know, so I'm not trying to claim some kind of optimal, you know, thing here. I just want to give people a sense of of the order of magnitude, at least, and maybe a single digit accuracy. Uh, you know, as was to what you might expect. So if I'm doing I/O. Um, here's a series of steps, and I've, I've, I've uh, magnified the device here. I've drawn some things inside the device. So uh, I've got to create a command and then send that command uh, to probably RAM in my SSD. This is step two, uh, showing the arrow going into RAM. And then uh, my SSD software runs, and, you know, does its processing, uh, and then it accesses the media. Uh, if this, for example, is a read, um, you know, and, and takes data here in step four from the media to the RAM, and then in step five, you know, sends it back and, and executes the response and so forth, right? So this is what's going on in a typical I.O., let's say, to an SSD. If it's a, a read instead of a write, the, you know, these, these steps may be slightly reordered, uh, you know, or a write instead of a read, um, you know, but conceptually it's a very similar series of events. Um, so how does that add up? Uh, here I've got a list of my steps, uh, one through six, uh, and categories for, you know, where, what's contribu you know, contribution from my host, from my network, from my device. And here you see that, you know, as typical for I.O., the largest contribution is probably coming from the device. Uh, the network contribution is probably very low compared to that when you're, when you're using, a, you know, a disk drive or SSD. Uh, and the host contribution, uh, you know, is, is generally somewhere in between, right? Um, so in this example, you know, I forced my, you know, just for, for apples to apples, uh, I've, I've said suppose I'm doing a 1K data transfer at 1 gigabyte per second. 1 gigabyte is not very fast, uh, you know, with today's uh, networks or especially memory systems. This is just to, to you know, support a, a simple calculation here. Um, you know, and I presumed I had one switch uh, at some moderate load. This was, was not I did not single threaded. Um, you know, and all of my units here are in microseconds. So you know, it just gives you an appreciation. You might you might add up to you know maybe 150 or so microseconds, depending on many variables. Uh, you know, some sometimes this can be a bit lower. Uh, you know, sometimes a bit higher, depending on the system context. 
Um, switching to uh, an RDMA write to persistent memory. This is a, a, you know, an area that we've explored quite a bit uh, within the NVM programming model. Uh, you know, there, there's uh, also a bright talk on RDMA. There's a link here. Uh, but here the context is, you know, I've got, I've, I've established an RDMA connection, and that's not part of my access time. That's something I've done in advance in this example. And then the application needs to do one or more RDMA writes, uh, and perhaps this is taking place during a flush. Perhaps the application is accessing, you know, local memory. Maybe it's got local persistent memory. Uh, you know, here I've just illustrated local RAM. Um, and, and at some point it wants to, tr to transmit that RAM or reflect it or, or mirror it, let's say, over to uh, another node, and it uses RDMA, a pre-existing RDMA connection, to do that. So it can just do RDMA writes, so and those are very efficient. However, um, there's no way uh, in the current protocol to force those writes all the way to the NVDIM itself. They end up, you know, taking some time in various volatile buffers along the way. So you need to do an extra round trip and interrupt the processor in step three in order to force everything that you sent through RDMA to actually re reach the persistent memory on the other side. Um, and then finally, the, the, you get a response essentially from that, from step three, from that forcing function, which here I, I've called a remote flush. There's a lot about this in, in, uh, in the uh, SNEA MVM programming model uh, documents, and I've got some links to some of those uh, later in the deck. So when I add this one up, it comes out quite a bit, you know, optimized relative to my, uh, you know, SSD example. This could still be used, you know, still be done, you know, RDMA can be used in the context of, uh, you know, SSDs as well. But uh, in this example, it's really just a, a remote access to persistent memory. And, you know, if only I had the function uh, that allowed me to, uh, you know, enforce the, you know, force the data all the way to persistent memory, uh, you know, during the, the RDMA write, um, you know, I could cut out tens of micro, you know, tens of microseconds from this, right? Um, and there, are, there is work in progress uh, to do better at that. Uh, and there are ways to configure some systems uh, for, you know, through, you know, non-cacheable, you know, mappings and um, various power, uh, you know, power management, uh, you know, extremes, let's say. Um, Although they're actually becoming more and more commonplace to, you know, to gracefully power down your system, uh, you know, so that you flush these volatile queues. So if you're doing more of that, uh, you may be able to get closer to just the device and network contributions here into the single digit microseconds. Um, you know, but in this example, if I'm still trying to transmit 1K at a gigabyte, I get up into the 54 microsecond range. Um, you know, but that doesn't tell, uh, you know, that necessarily the whole story, right? A big part of the problem is the remote flush, uh, and work is being done to optimize that. And, you know, so the goal is to get this type of access down into under 10 microseconds, uh, you know, in a, in a you know, stable sort of steady state system. Uh, but still today, it's, it's very difficult to, you know, to reach remote persistence within that sort of, you know, less than 10 microsecond uh, threshold. So that's my example for an optimized, uh, you know, remote access to persistent memory using RDMA over a network. So now you're starting to see here that, uh, first of all, as soon as I start trying to use a network, I get into, you know, uh, at least 100 nanoseconds, if not a microsecond of contribution, uh, you know, from the network itself. So I'm very quickly starting to eat up that little cross-hatched area. Right in my uh, in my latency disruption graph. Right, so um, if I'm using a network to access my persistent memory, uh, you know, it actually turns out to be very difficult to keep that uh, latency low enough to avoid the pain of stalling, uh, you know, my CPU. Enter another example, and here I I have a slide that I've uh, borrowed from the Gen Z consortium. Uh, you know, the Gen Z is a, a, a new open standard for a memory, uh, a memory fabric, a memory interconnect, uh, which is really designed to run at memory speed, sub 100 nanosecond, uh, you know, load to use latency. 
uh, the idea being that you can have, uh, you know, some, some processors here. They're labeled SOC systems on chip, uh, interconnected through a Gen Z, interconnect to, uh, you know, memory and other things as well. Perhaps network and storage, perhaps some accelerators such as GPUs. Uh, you know, but the important thing is that this, the Gen Z is designed to be a fabric that runs at memory speed. It's designed to be inserted into the path between the processor and the memory. Uh, you could even think of it as a, a candidate for replacing, you know, DDR, for example. Um, you know, so I'm not making any kind of prediction or prognostication about that, but this is just a way to picture, you know, one of the roles that Gen Z could play in a, in a system. Um, so given this type of, uh, you know, should I call it a network? Uh, that's arguable, right? So I'm going to call it, that's why I use the word interconnect, or sometimes I call it a memory fabric, right? But if you're in this realm, right, then, you you know, you, you're doing load store access to, you know, persistent memory in sort of a scale-out mode, um, you know, and you say, okay, is this persistent memory remote? Well, if, you know, this kind of blurs the definition. Right, because it's a it's a memory fabric that scales in perhaps a different way than a network. Uh, the, but the point is that I, here I've given an illustration where it really is feasible to use a store instruction, let's say, to write to uh, memory that is in a different fault domain that would fail separately from you know the origin of, of where the write came from. Um, you know, which for fault tolerance is, you know, is a key property. And that's one of the reasons why people go remote, uh, not the only one, you know, is to, to have their data available in a different place. Well, you know, depending on how you build something like a Gen Z-based memory system, you know, you may be able to get that kind of uh, fault isolation within the, the sort of scale-out memory fabric. Um, you know, so here I'm conceptualizing the store instruction that actually does the write to remote memory using you know, an interconnect such as Gen Z, um, and I add that up, right, um, and um, I get into the five microsecond range, but there's a problem. Um, you know, what I've modeled here, it's hard for me to model this uh, in the same way as uh, the IO and RDMA examples, right, because, uh, you know, the loader store instruction is doing typically a cache line. Um, so here I'm doing individual cache lines at a gigabyte per second, right? So in, in many ways, I've kind of wounded my, my example here by trying to equate it, uh, you know, to the other examples. Um, you know, so this does not, uh, you know, you, you can do much better than this, uh, you know, if you use move instructions, uh, you know, for example, to do more than 64 bytes at a time, right? So that's why I said, okay, uh, I've got, what, you know, for each store, you know, really only takes a few hundred nanoseconds, right? But when, you, when I do 16 of those, they add up, so I would be much better off, uh, you know, doing a more, a more bulk using either a move or ultimately a DMA, uh, you know, before I reach this five microsecond, uh, you know, uh, barrier, let's say. Um, you know, so I was not entirely fair, really, to the memory fabric in adding up this example, but you can see how, uh, you know, especially for very small accesses, this is quite a different uh, equation, quite a different system. Uh, the other thing that's unfair is this one gigabyte limit for a memory fabric. You'd never run it at a gigabyte. It would always be much higher speed than that. Um, you know, so rolling things up. Uh, okay, I got ahead of myself. I want to talk about one more thing, which is the scale aspect. Uh, you know, as you scale your system up, uh, you know, here I've, I've, I've drawn an illustration of a rack, uh, you know, and pointed out that you, you may have some, something like blades inside uh, chassis that are in a rack. You know, so you've got perhaps a top of rack element, and you've got, the, you know, a switch there and a switch perhaps in the chassis, and there may even be switches on the blades to uh, integrate various components that are on the blade. All right, so if I'm going uh, through within one rack, I might have, you know, two or three switch layers. If I'm going between racks, I might have more like five or six, uh, you know, switch layers. Um, you know, so very quickly this starts to add up again if I'm trying to do memory access. Uh, you know, uh, you know, so I, I, I think that as a rule, as a rule of thumb, um, you know, we're likely to see, you know, on the fastest memory networks that, that may be able to be able to scale up to a rack. 
Um, but when you start getting across multiple racks at trying to do memory speed, it's going to get kind of challenging. Uh, you know, so maybe some people will be able to do special, you know, multi-rack. You know, but if you if you want to know where's that boundary, I would say think of it as a rack. Uh, and partly, that, you know, that's just a little bit of the speed of light problem, but in more more so, you know, how many switch layers would you typically have to go through in order to navigate you know, through this kind of a typical, you know, modularity. Uh, you know, going from one rack to another. So I come back to my uh, diagram, but this time it's got a twist. Um, instead of illustrating several technologies, I put little representations of my latency budget stack ups uh, on this cra graph, right? The three that I just went through I've illustrated here. Now, you have to take this with a grain of salt visually because it's a log scale. Um, and it's very, you know, I, I didn't try to represent uh, the, the sizes of the, the stacking bar elements. You know, when you try to do that in a log scale, it gets weird. All right, so don't try, don't overinterpret that. Um, but just kind of stand back and say, okay, look, you know, if I am doing, uh, you know, I/O uh, or even RDMA, um, you know, especially if I'm going over a network. I'm probably not really in the load store domain. I'm probably, in fact, in, in the I.O. domain in this picture. Um, on the other hand, if I'm careful uh, with persistent memory, uh, you know, that really is running at memory speed, uh, you know, then I may be able to get more into that new range or maybe just a little ways into the, the middle ground where things might start getting painful. Um, so if you're trying to do load store at an application level with your persistent memory media, um, you know, networks are, can, you know, can very quickly become an issue uh, unless you're really dealing with a memory fabric. And even then, if you try to run at more than rack scale, you're probably going to start running into issues, uh, you know, with latency. And if the technology that doesn't match, right, if there's no way for you to get into the lower part of that 200 to 2 microsecond, uh, you know, range because of your media, then you're, you're probably not really doing load, you know, going to do load store. It'll probably get kind of painful. Um, and that pain depends also on how big is your persistent memory access, you know, characteristics of your workload, basically. What is, you know, the mix? How much, how often do you access persistent memory in, for an application? Uh, and how often do you have to flush? Because the, you know, the flush, uh, disrupts the CPU pipeline in its own way. Uh, you know, as uh, you know, as, as it flushes uh, all of the caches, you know, in the CPU out to memory. Um, you know, so this is a you know revisitation of the latency disruption picture. Uh, you know, with a little bit of the data that I've, that I've built up um, represented. Um, so uh, here is a slide of helpful resources. It sounds like Jay's ready to take over. I am always ready to take over when necessary. That's my personality. Uh, Which yeah, so it is. I'm going to go over the. <laughs> it definitely is. I'm going to go over the links here on this page, and move on to the next page for a little bit more information, and then return here uh, uh, so that we can get some of these links uh, before the presentation is posted. I know it's a little bit difficult to uh, to write things down in time, um, but each of the presentations you see here are excellent companion pieces to this webinar. Um, if you didn't get a chance to watch the first of the series, uh, I think that this is, it's, an, it's a really good discussion of how many of the concepts we spoke about with respect to input and output and load store and goes into some very uh, useful detail about how each of these different mechanisms work. If you're, if you're curious about how the performance can be affected in both good and bad ways, uh, we recommend that you take a look at the everything you wanted to know about storage, but we're too proud to ask part teal. This series is designed to help IT professionals who may be well versed in a um, uh, in different areas of data center technology, such as compute or networking, and help bring home some of these concepts in a clear language. And so we have a, a, a seminar specifically on focusing regarding buffers, queuing, and caches, and, and really does augment this particular presentation quite well. Finally, if you're going to find out, if you want to find out how uh, to know if your system is set up correctly, you can go and uh, take a look at the storage performance benchmarking webinar, one of our most popular series, in fact, and it'll give you an end-to-end -end perspective of the consequences of tuning and tweaking. 
And all of this work goes hand in hand to give you a holistic understanding of, you know, the complex interactive systems of memory and storage and, and how it relates, especially to new systems that are coming down the road uh, with uh, with different memory and, and persistent memory and storage class memory and, and, and really just expands upon the stuff that we've been talking about today. Um, as I said, we'll return to the slide um, uh, in a second so that you can take a look at how to get to the, the technical documents and white papers that go into more explicit detail about uh, how to apply these concepts in the real world. For now, though, I'd like to remind you that we're very interested in your feedback. If you think that this fell short of your expectations, please feel free to give us constructive criticism. We really do want to uh, make sure that these are useful and, variable, uh, and valuable. Um, and as I mentioned before, the webcast and a PDF of the slides uh, will be posted. In fact, the, the PDF has already been posted on SMIA's Ethernet storage form, so you can go right now and download uh, those available that are on demand. And we're also going to be providing a full Q&A for the webcast, including some more thorough answers to the questions we've already had today. Uh, and finally, one of the best ways to get in touch with us and also offer suggestions or comments or um, you know, have ideas for topics is to follow us on Twitter. We're aiming to provide as much useful information as we can in the world of storage and storage networking that's uh, vendor neutral and technology centric. So our Twitter account is where we announce the latest blogs, webinars, and events, and, uh, and we're not a very high volume Twitter account, but we do, um, we do get out the information as to events and, and uh, new, new items uh, on a regular basis. So let's go back to the previous slide with URL links and, out, uh, and answer our outstanding questions. And if you have any additional ones, please feel free to ask, although we are out of time. Actually, we are out of time. So um, actually, I'm going to go ahead and leave this question here, Doug, because it's, it's kind of ancillary to this. And um, we'll just go ahead and, and uh, leave this up for the time being so that people can write down what they need. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and, and thank you, our audience, for your time today. Uh, again, please don't forget to rate and comment. And thanks, too, to Doug Voigt for an excellent presentation, as always. So thank you, Doug, and thank you to our um, cherished guests. See you soon. Talk to you later.